It finally happened. Penguins captain Sidney Crosby at long last has signed a two year extension. And we are going to talk about that on this edition of the Locked On Penguins podcast. Your Locked On Penguins, your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Penguins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Patrick Damp. You can follow me on Twitter at synonym for wet Joined live to tape from Aruba with my co-host Hunter Hodes on a day where there's big news, so he had to join us from the beach. You can follow him on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. You can give our show's account a follow at LO underscore Penguins. And of course, thank you for making this part of your daily routine. And don't forget that we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts as well as YouTube. And before we dive into the big news of the day, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Head to FanDuel.com to get started. So, damn you, Penguins. I had just finished doing a solo episode, allowing Hunter to enjoy his vacation at the beach, and they decide to drop the news that they have finally re-signed Captain Sidney Crosby to a two-year deal that goes through the 26-27 NHL season at an average annual value of, yes, you guessed it, $8.7 million. So Crosby will remain with the Penguins for at least the next three years. And it has been a long time coming. We have been waiting for this extension for months now. We thought it was going to happen around the time of free agency, and then it didn't. And then we get the report midsummer that an extension is imminent. They just got to put pen to paper. And then we think, okay, he's going to sign it on 8-7, his birthday, because he's just an absolute psychopath. That comes and goes. It doesn't happen. And then he tells Elliot Friedman on 32 Thoughts, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to sign an extension. And then this morning, which is Monday morning, the newest episode of 32 Thoughts drops. And he says, I think this Crosby extension is going to get done this week. Then Patrick Damp, like an absolute clown, records a solo episode of Locked on Penguins without Hunter is about to publish it, and then this news drops. So, Hunter, two-year extension for Sidney Crosby, $8.7 million. Take it away. Pat, there is so much to like about this contract. You know, even the short term, you know, he signed for the next three years. Once that is up, I still think it's very possible that he signs another one or two year extension if he wants to keep playing with the Penguins to finish off his career. Or, Pat, he could just keep doing, you know, one year extension after one year extension until he's ready to retire. 8.7 million. I mean, how great is this guy? He easily could have commanded 10 million plus, 10.5, maybe even. 11 million if he wanted to, but he decided to stay at his old AAV because he knows the Penguin salary cap situation is what it is. Elliot Freeman was kind of discussing that on 32 Thoughts, saying how he really doesn't want to screw over the Penguins long term with their salary cap situation. It just goes to show what a great person he is overall. And I mean, th- this contract really is, it- it's great for him. It's great for the Penguins. They have the core locked up now for at least the next three years. They came in together. They're going to go out together. We have been waiting for this contract for a very long time. And now we finally have it. We don't have to worry about this anymore. And also, I want to say thoughts and prayers to the Canadian media out there who really thought that Sidney Crosby was going to get dealt at this year's trade deadline. Sorry, SDPN. That was not going to happen. Sorry, TSN. That was also not going to happen. Sidney Crosby is a Penguin for at least the next three years. And I think he's going to be a Penguin beyond that because I think he'll keep signing one-year contracts. I mean, especially if he wants to, but I think he's going to go down that route anyway, but he was never leaving. They get this done. Um, just a super good day in penguin land. And I loved it. You know, I'm sitting on the beach reading my book. I get a bunch of alerts on my phone. I see that it happened. I'm like, okay, Pat, let's go record this for 10 to 12 minutes before we put out today's episode, but super happy about this contract. And yeah, those are really all my main thoughts on it. 
right there with you and just programming note for our listeners this episode will sound a little awkward when it publishes because i did like i said i recorded about a 30 minute solo episode and it was before the crosby extension so i'm going to do some editing and get that dropped in it's going to sound a little awkward so bear with us we appreciate it but back to the news of the day i am right there with you like we have said it on the show so many times that there was no world where this didn't get done. Maybe not not to say there was no world because anything can happen, especially in pro sports, but it felt like it was just inevitability. It was going to happen at one point or another, and he was not going to go into his own words. He was not going to go into this season without a contract extension. Now, one thing I did say that is going to hit the cutting room floor from this episode uh, when I was recording solo is my thought process was I think the holdup was loyalty and not that he didn't want to be here or that he felt betrayed or anything like that, but he pretty much said as much to Elliot Friedman that he doesn't want to become burdensome to the organization. He doesn't want to have this team thinking, okay, we've got Sidney Crosby, but we're in such a bad spot that Sidney Crosby's all we've got. So I was saying I could have seen a world where he signs like a four to five year deal, but kind of tells them like, hey, if it gets to the end of this deal, I'm not going to go ring chasing, but I'm going to help with this rebuild. And I still I'm likely still going to have a ton of value. You can send me off to a contender, get a bunch of picks, get a bunch of prospects and really juice up this rebuild because he's a loyal guy to a fault and doesn't want to be seen as a burden on the organization. But now with this deal, two years, $8.7 million through the 26-27 season, that consequentially, if you go to Puckpedia and look at the Penguins' current salary cap structure, if Denny Malkin is a UFA in 26-27, that 26-27 season, Chris Letang will have two years left. That's the last season of Eric Carlson's deal. So... This also is lining up to an extent where maybe, depending on what everybody else wants to do, that could be them running past the tape for this era of Penguins hockey. No, I I hear you on that. But another thing I also really like about this deal, it allows the Penguins to at least try to be as competitive as they, you know, quote unquote can be, even though Kyle Dubas, we all know that he's doing this retool slash rebuild on the fly. Another thing, Pat, you look at the extension breakdown, look at this for Crosby. Year one, his salary is $780,000. He has a 9 million signing bonus. Year two, not even 1.1 million in salary, 6.53 signing bonus. I mean, Again, this just goes to show how great of a person he is, both on and off the ice, how much he cares for this organization, how he's leaving money on the table to help the Penguins out with their salary cap situation because he knows that they're going to try to at least, you know, potentially add a little bit to try and get this team back to the playoffs, whether it's this year, next year, even the year after, even though they're doing this retool slash rebuild on the fly, I don't think they're ever going to be truly, like, tank worthy bad during these next couple of years but it's just another reason why Sidney Crosby is so beloved in this city in the NHL just looking at that contract again there is nothing to dislike about it absolutely and this furthers my theory that I have about one of the ways they're angling this team into the next few seasons in that you get Sidney Crosby on that same $8.7 million AAV. This season, whatever happens, happens. If they get back into the playoffs, great. See what happens. You got a seat at the table, and it's the Stanley Cup playoffs. Stranger things have happened in the NHL postseason. But going into next summer, they're going to have a boatload of cap space and a lot of contracts will come off the books going into next year. You look at next year, Lars Eller, end of his deal. They signed that Anthony Bavillier deal. That's done at the end of ne- at the end of this season. Drew O'Connor, UFA. Matt Nieto, UFA. Marcus Pedersen, if they don't extend him, UFA. Matt Grizzlick, UFA. Ryan Shea, UFA. And you think about that, a ton of money off the books, 
rising salary cap, all your biggest names are locked up for the foreseeable future. You could, in theory, make some big splashes and say, you know what, 25, 26, that's our last true blue go for it year. We're going to make a bunch of big moves. We got the core locked up. They're all on affordable deals and we have the space to make something happen. So I think that was probably a conversation that Kyle Dubas had with Sidney Crosby to say like, Hey, listen, you take this short term extension. We're going to have a ton of cap space. We've got some young talent in the system that could come up on very affordable deals. And when we have a ton of room, we can go make a few swings and we can try to do this one last time. Right. And I feel like they were trying to speed it up a little bit, at least late in the summer here when they got Rucker McGordy. Again, that move just screamed to me. Yeah, we know we're taking some chances on some reclamation projects, but we see a young player who can help us now and into the future. And it felt like that this move was like, okay, Sid, we know that you're at the end of your career. Same with Evgeny Malkin, same with Crystal Tang. Let's try speeding this up and have this be one of potential several other moves maybe during the season and especially during next offseason where they can get this team back to playoffs to maybe have somehow one last hurrah going on a deep run. Again, I don't know if I, I don't think I expect a deep playoff run at this point, but again, that McGrory tra- trade at the time just again signaled to me that they really wanted to speed this thing up at least a little bit. But Again, man, it's a great day here in Pittsburgh, and I'm super stoked that Crosby isn't here for the next three years. He's going to go out with the core like he came in with them. And the, the really, I don't think I have much else to say about this contract. It, it really is, again, a great deal for both sides. If I was maybe surprised by one tiny thing, it's that it's two years, not three. But I think we were all waiting for this contract because Crosby was trying to determine how long do I want to sign for it? Do I want it to be two years, three, four, five years? I think if it was a bit longer term, maybe the AAV would have gone up potentially a little bit, but you knew 8.7 was going to be in there somewhere. Um, again, slam dunk move for the Penguins, and I'm super stoked about it. Absolutely. So am I. So two-year deal, 8.7 million AAV kicks in after this season, and I'm going to go let Hunter – enjoy the beach and get out of here. When we come back, you will get parts of my solo episode I recorded earlier today. I'm going to give you a few players to watch during training camp and then a quick update on the prospect tournament where the Penguins currently sit 2-0 and after two big wins. But we will do that when we come back right after this. But first, we got to tell you about our first sponsor, and that is FanDuel. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Well, we have something a little different for you now through September 22nd. All FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. I have NFL Sunday ticket, guys. I was rocking the quad box all afternoon yesterday. Makes for an incredible NFL Sunday viewing experience. But when obviously the Steelers are on, I'm going with YouTube TV's broadcast of the Pittsburgh Steelers. But then it's right back to the quad box when it's time. Then with a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out of market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel anytime. Just visit FanDuel.com and download America's number one sports book. We have finally made it, Penguins fans. The dog days of summer are behind us, and training camp officially opens this week. The Penguins will report to the UPMC Lemieux Sports Complex on Wednesday to kick off training camp and get into the process of getting this team ready for the regular season. So with that in mind today, I'm going to talk about a few players that I'm going to have my eye on when training camp opens. Obviously, this is not going to be an exhaustive list because this is going to be a very interesting training camp as Hunter and I hinted at last week during one of our episodes because There's a lot of competition expected in this upcoming training camp. The Penguins made quite a few moves this summer, whether it was free agency or trade. They clearly have some designs on bringing up some younger players and giving them a shot this year. Obviously, we know who the top six is going to be. We have a pretty solid idea of who is going to make the team on defense. And then, of course, there's the goaltenders. Tristan Jari and Alex Nadelkovich will very clearly 
be your two NHL goaltenders this year. But let's dig into that just a little bit. One of the first people, and I guess you could say two of the people that I'm keeping an eye on for when training camp opens this week is the goalies. This is a gigantic year for Tristan Jari, and I think we all know that. We all understand that. He melted down once again as the games got bigger, and Alex Nadelkovich, for all intents and purposes, took his job. Now, that said, Hunter and I have gone over this multiple times. I think it's a little bit misleading and a little bit of a misnomer that Alex Nadelkovich stole the starting job. Because when you pop open the hood, when you look at their numbers, especially as Alex Nadelkovic overtook the net down the stretch as the Penguins were attempting to make the playoffs, which, as we know, they ultimately fell short. It wasn't so much that they had received improved goaltending play. What happened pretty much was the Penguins remembered how to score. We all know the story of this team for the last few years. They have the process. They do a lot of things right. They do things that you would believe would lead to goals, but the pucks, just for whatever reason, don't go in. Once Alex Nadelkovich took over, the Penguins were starting to average three to four goals a game rather than one to two. So if Alex Nadelkovich slipped up or didn't make a save, you had offense there to make a baseball reference it was essentially giving your starting pitcher run support you were giving Alex Nadelkovich that kind of cushion to be able to maybe let in a soft one or if he gives up one on a penalty kill then you know that you've got offense there that can make up for that you so much didn't have that through a large portion of the year with Tristan Jari but Jari's play was also not all that great now <clears throat> Excuse me. The main thing I've been saying that I'm looking for this season is I want to see time split with these two. You obviously have seen Tristan Jari early in the season. He has made multiple all star games. He has led the league in shutouts. He has had an above average save percentage in the first half of the season, but then he starts to wear down and fall apart. Now that you know you have a very stable and capable backup again in Alex Nadelkovic, it's going to be on Mike Sullivan to better parse out their workloads, to make it so you don't get to the point where Tristan Jari weighs, uh, falls apart and wears down into the end of the season. So I'm going to keep an eye on that throughout the preseason, but that's going to be a little bit difficult because we know you have Blumquist, you have Murashov, you have Godier, a lot of goaltending depth in the system. So you may not get a good shot at this or a good look at this throughout preseason and training camp because there's going to be a lot of other goaltenders to look at within the system and they want to see where they go. But I will keep an eye on the goaltenders throughout training camp. Keeping it on the defensive side, we also have to talk about somebody who had a very underwhelming season last year, and that is Ryan Graves. I don't need to rehash the whole season for Ryan Graves. It was a contract that now looks like an absolute boat anchor on this team's salary cap. He did not really fit into the Penguin system last year. And I'm just going to read Kyle Dubas's quote from the end of the season when he was asked about Ryan Graves. And he said, quote, there's no dancing around it. He was a very good player in Colorado and in New Jersey, and they are both very good teams. Came in, and from the beginning, I thought, you know what? It happens. Did I expect it to go the whole year? No. And part of that is on us as an organization, as much as it is on Ryan, to push and find his way through the summer, and it's a massive summer for him. That is about as close as someone like Kyle Dubas gets to burying a player. That's just not his style, for better or for worse. He does not go out and bury players in the media, but this is a huge training camp and a huge year for Ryan Graves. For what he's making, for what they want out of him, he has to bounce back, and I think the opportunity is there for him. I think we saw it last year. His game started to get marginally better throughout the end of the season when they were putting him in a more sheltered role, when they were putting him on a third pairing. And I think that's where it's going to start this year and has to start this year. Now, I understand 
the contract he has, the money he's making in the role he's supposed to play, you don't want that much money on your third pairing. But I think you have to rehab him in that position. You have to put him in that sheltered role. Let him find his game again. Let him build his confidence back up. And the better he starts playing, should he start playing better, you slowly but surely move him off up the lineup. Now, Sullivan, I'm begging you right now, whatever you do, don't put him with Carlson. We know that doesn't work. We know for a fact that does not work. It has been an abject disaster, and most of it isn't really because of just Ryan Graves. The two of them just don't work together. It's oil and water. Their styles do not match. The chemistry is not there. So let him get his game together in a, in a bottom pairing role. Let him build his confidence back up and then see what he can do, say, with Chris Letang. And if you have to put Matt Grizzlick down on a third pairing, then all of a sudden I think you've got some good defensive depth. You will have some sneaky good defense on all three pairs. So if they're able to redevelop him, I think they're in a good spot. But he has to prove it in training camp. He has to be among the standouts on the defense. He has to be one of the better players. So. Now let's move on to some positives that I'm going to keep an eye on coming up here this week and throughout the month in training camp. Got to go with the big acquisition, and that's Rutger McGrory. For the first time in a long time, the Penguins have a young, exciting prospect in the system, but we do have to taper our expectations a little bit. Is he going to become a superstar, a generational talent? More likely. No, then yes. But the guy really does have the makings of a very good, very productive NHL player. I think if they get this right, if he takes the next step, he's going to be a huge part of the Penguins franchise moving forward. And this is the other side of it, though, that we do have to discuss. He made a big bet on himself. He wanted to take the next step in Winnipeg. They disagreed, he held out, and they traded him. And when you make that big bet, you have to be right, or at the very least, you have to be close to right. He cannot come in and bomb. He can't come in and look out of place. He can't come in and look overwhelmed. And I don't think he will. Uh, by all accounts, this kid is a true professional. I'm going to talk about the prospect challenge here in the second segment. And he has looked like one of the best players on the ice. That looks like he's somebody who is poised to take that next step. Doesn't look like he belongs in a prospect tournament. He looks like he belongs on an NHL preseason roster and getting his feet wet in the National Hockey League. But like I was saying, you take that big bet on yourself that I believe I'm an NHL player. I'm ready to become a pro. Don't send me back to college or don't keep me in the AHL for an extended period of time. I want to be on an NHL roster. When you make that big bet on yourself, it has to pay off. So going to keep an eye on him. I think he's got a really good shot. I hope that they're going to give him an extended look in the top six, specifically with Sidney Crosby, just to see what he can do. And if he doesn't look out of place, that's a huge win for the Pittsburgh Penguins and Kyle Dubas's strategy of this little retooling on the fly, this getting younger people in the system and making it so this team has some young legs. So really excited for training camp. We have finally made it. So when we come back, we're going to finish up the show by talking about the prospects challenge where the Penguins currently sit 2-0. I'm going to give you some thoughts on that, and we will do that right after this. Let's keep it going here, and let's talk about the prospects challenge. Before we get into it, my apologies to you listeners on our Thursday episode last week. I said that the Penguins played on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They do not. They play Friday, Saturday, and then they close it out this evening against the Buffalo Sabres at 5 o'clock, not Sunday. That was my goof. I screwed that up. I got to read better people, but it was the end of the week. It was a birthday week. I was pretty much like Hunter in vacation mode and just ready to get done for the week. So that's my bad. But let's talk about the first two games of the prospect challenge. The Penguins get two big wins 
one against the Boston Bruins on Friday, and then another one on Saturday against the Ottawa Senators. And tale of two different games, the Penguins with a huge, huge comeback against the Bruins prospects. And it was a doozy of a game. Uh, we spoke about at the end of the first segment there, watching Rucker McGrory here in training camp and how he's going to look and how he needs to take that next step. Well, two points on Friday against the Bruins, goal and an assist, and more so than that, just looked like the absolute best player on the ice. He did not look like he belonged there. He looked like a player that should be getting ready for NHL training camp and is ready to take that next step. But as we talked about, that's exactly what you want to see from a guy like Rucker McGroarty when it comes to the NHL prospects challenge up in Buffalo. You don't want him to just look like another contributor on the ice. You want him to be the best player, and he absolutely was. He was very effective in all three zones. He also had what looked like it should have been a goal, but did not go in, hit the crossbar. However, there's no video review in the prospects challenge, so we move on. But just a great, great performance and showing by him. And that is, again, what we want to see from him. Another player that stood out to me, Tristan Bros, two goals, and he, very similar to Rucker McGroarty, is looking like a prospect that could be a big part of this team's future. He was all over the ice, two goals, and just played a very powerful game. He, again, similar to McGroarty, looked like a player that didn't belong there. That is a guy who you think, when you see him there, you're thinking, okay, we want to see him play well. We want to see him make his mark, but he goes out and damn near dominates. And this is exciting times for the Penguins prospects because, again, we have not had prospects in the system like this for quite some time. We've had a lot of surprises, guys who were late round picks that went through the developmental process from the Wheeling Nailers in the ECHL to the Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins in the American Hockey League. And then all of a sudden, a few years later, they come up and make their mark in the National Hockey League. And we all kind of don't expect to see these guys come in. They're a little bit of a surprise. I don't think we're seeing that with guys like Rucker McGroarty and Tristan Bros. We're seeing two guys who have pedigrees of being very successful at the collegiate level and in the developmental programs on the international stage. So I think these guys are looking very good. Now, again, we do have to temper expectation. Did they look good in a prospect tournament? Of course they did. We want them to look good in a prospect tournament, but we have to keep it in perspective. It's not quite a man against man, for lack of a better term, tournament. This is not the National Hockey League. This is not these guys going out and playing against top flight competition especially when you look at a team like Boston, who is in a very similar situation as the Penguins. They've been contenders and in go-for-it mode for the better part of a decade plus. So not a lot of blue-chip prospects in that system as well. So you're not really looking for them to be against the best competition. Then the Senators, a little bit of a different story, but still, again, the same you're looking at a lot of guys who have been playing in junior, a lot of guys who have been playing in college. They're not seasoned NHL players. However, Boston did have a lot of guys who have spent time in the ECHL and the AHL, so they do have professional experience. So that is an encouraging sign for those two prospects. But the main focus for me, the main idea that I got out of the first two games, the main thing that came top of mind to me was Sergei Murashov. He has had a very solid showing. He split duties in game one against the Boston Bruins, and then he played the full game against the Ottawa Senators prospects. So this is clearly somebody that they want to get an extended look at. They clearly have designs on this kid becoming a big goalie in their system. They obviously see a future for him as a top goaltending prospect because we know that they're playing three games. They took three goalies and he's one of them. But the fact that he splits duties on Friday against the Bruins, and then he plays a full game 
against the Senators and looks very good, does not look out of place. Was he an absolutely dominant goalie that shut the door completely? No, but I will say a lot of encouraging signs, especially against the Senators' prospects. You could see in that game that Ottawa had a lot of extended zone time, especially when they had the power play because it was a very heavy special teams game on Saturday against the Senators, a lot of penalties. And he stood very tall in those extended zone times. He was able to steady the ship when the Senators would get momentum. And if you're a top flight goaltender, or at the very least a top flight goaltending prospect, that's what you want to see out of that goalie. You want them to be a steadying force when teams inevitably push back, when you're hemmed in your own zone for 45 seconds, 60 seconds, over a minute, and the other team is getting chances, they're getting opportunities to score, but you know that you have a solid goalie in net who can make a big save to keep the game at even or hold on to your lead or maybe not even make the deficit worse. You want to have them back there to be able to make a big save, cover the puck, and blunt that momentum so you can get a line change. You can stop the onslaught that's coming. And by all accounts, especially against the Senators, Sergei Morishov did that, and he looked very good doing it. So that's a very encouraging sign, but it does tell me that the Penguins' coaches and management want to get an extended look at him. They finish up the prospects challenge this evening at five o'clock against the Buffalo Sabres prospects. You'll be able to watch that on the Penguins website today. Again, that's five o'clock. So you'll be able to see one more look at these prospects before we open up training camp on Wednesday. Okay, so that is going to do it for the Monday edition. I know a little bit of an awkward episode since the Sidney Crosby news dropped and we had to bring Hunter in for that opening segment, but we appreciate you sticking with us on this one. I will be back with a new episode for you on Tuesday. I've got some feelers out there. I want to get a nice guest on here to give us a little bit of a preview of this week's training camp, but for Hunter Hodes, I am Patrick Damp. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, and we will be back with a brand new episode on Tuesday.